A message to all the men out there. We, uh, we need to step up our game, folks. Men are falling behind in our economy, our society, and it's about time to pay attention, get a little concerned. Uh, we thought some of these numbers might help you do so. Uh, let's take a, just a glance. Let's talk about college education. Men right now make up 43%, 43% of college graduates. Women, I mean, this is astonishing, 57% to men, 43%. Think what those ratios were just 10, 15, 20 years ago. Unemployment. Men, 7.9% unemployment rate as of last month. 7.1% of women. The median income from, for, I mean, this is, this is startling. Uh, and has big, big implications, not just for men, but for the country. Income, $32,844 was the median income in, in 1968, $32,844. The income now, median income for men, $32,137. That is $700 less since 1968. Stunning. Men also now in part because of earning power, are beginning to simply boycott marriage. 80% of men were married in, the, in their late 20s uh, in the 1970s. Now, 40%, half in their late 20s are married. So what's happening? A lot of them, frankly, now are living at home, uh, living with their parents, 13% of men aged 25 to 34 lived with their parents in 2000. Now it's up to 19% they have mom doing their laundry. Six, fatherhood, a big issue. Men who become fathers, they're becoming more and more absent and fewer of them. In the 1960s, 11%, 11% of children lived away from their fathers. Now... 27% of children live apart from their dads. And since there are more women raising kids without a father, they're more likely to have fewer children. The average fertility rate in the 1960s was 3.7. That means each woman was bearing, on average, just under four children. Now, the fertility rate is 2.07%. That is just below replacement level. With all of these ego-deflating and shattering statistics, it's no wonder the erectile dysfunction drug market is also booming, sales topping $5 billion a year. Viagra, that little blue pill that was introduced only 15 years ago, its makers now proudly boast they're the most counterfeited drug in the country. Joining me now, psychologist and author of the controversial new book, Men on Strike, Dr. Helen Smith, it is great to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me on. Man, talk about something that gets everybody going here, the issue of it, men boycotting yes. Yes. Uh, life. Uh, why have men gone on strike? Let's start there. I think a lot of men have gone on strike because they feel like the, the incentives are just not there for them anymore. The, 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 the risks of marriage and a lot of things for men are, today are very high, and the rewards for men are very low. In the past, I think that we had, we had so many things. Men got respect, and they had more freedom, and they had... Uh, more male space. And today, when men get married, I think that they feel like there's much more loss of freedom. There are financial risks, and there are so many things that have happened. Um, women have sort of risen up, and they've become the breadwinners, and they do so many things. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have not looked at the domestic realm and the way that men are treated in our society. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's fascinating to me, because as, as we've just gone through, uh, all of the forces at work here to find that wages for men are actually less today, the median wage for men is less today than in 1968. Exactly. The implications of that are extraordinary. They can't support a family uh, on that median That's one uh, of the reasons they can't, so they can't support families, so um, lower-income women don't want men as often, and lower-income men are getting let, married less and less at mm -hmm. all ages. And part of it is not just that they're going on strike, but the women a lot of times don't want lower-level men. The other thing is women are becoming so highly educated now that they want higher level men and the men don't want to go to college anymore. 
because mm -hmm. colleges have become so feminized in some sense that a lot of men don't. It starts early in the earlier grades. What, what do you mean feminized? Uh, I, I think, I mean, that resonates, but what do you mean? I mean that everything has become about what girls need, what women need. It's not about what boys need. A lot of times boys are into mastery, they're into you know, skill, competition, and our schools are so filled now with people who only look at sitting still, reading books that are yeah. basically for girls, and a lot of boys are interested in other things. They don't want to just sit still, and they want to learn in a different type of way, and the schools don't allow that. We have boys in this country who can't read, and nobody does anything about that. We also have so many female teachers. There are only 16% of teachers now are men in the elementary schools. Is that right? Yes, and those female teachers, according to the, the London School of Economics, did a study, and they found that female teachers as a whole give lower marks to boys. Well, those son of the guns. Yes. Well, I don't know. <laughs> well. the, the, the reality is right now society uh, is becoming such a constrained place. The political mm -hmm. correctness, hidebound orthodoxies, uh, women are doing well, but not mm -hmm. as well as it might be inferred. Right. For example, the Pew Research uh, study just recently showing that women well, were, uh, amount to 40% of the breadwinners. Mm -hmm. But when you look at those numbers, 63% of those women are on average earning $23,000 yes. a year. Right. They are effectively dependent on the state. They are yes. not breadwinners. It's the wrong term. They're not, they're not winning and there's not much bread there. But what's happening is they don't need men anymore. You see, no, the I, they've let state have become their husband. The state is now the husband. That's and a great way to put it. That's the exactly what it is. The Husbands are now expendable. And the state isn't. Uh, right. it's, a, it's a level of dependency uh, that uh, is going to alter the way we live. You think the American dream itself is at risk? I do, because I think that to exclude men and to say that men aren't important as fathers and, and as um, as a, as a part of our society, I think to do that is to have many men who are on the side and who aren't participating in society. More and more men, Charles Murray wrote a book, Coming Apart, and he right. looked at... Terrific book. It's a great book. But he found that more and more men are dropping out of work, and one of the reasons is they're going more and doing leisure things. And one of the reasons is they can't keep up anymore. A man can't go and make thirty or $40,000 because a woman can make that much, you know, from the government or other sources, mm -hmm. and she doesn't need him anymore, and he can't be... And he's lost. There's a lot of respect that's lost there. Helen, I'd, I'd, I'd love if you could come back and we could continue the conversation. It's an so important one. It's an important conversation and a very, very important book, which is Men on Strike. It's on sale online and at bookstores now everywhere. Or go to LouDobbs.com for links to the book. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Helen Smith. You. We're going to continue this show's theme of the war on men, and I am very excited to have Dr. Helen Smith with me now, the author of Men on Strike, joining me now in the studio. Uh, Helen, what do you mean when you say men are on strike? How? Um, men are on strike in terms of like marriage, fatherhood, and even the American dream in the sense that they're not even going to college as often because uh, there, are, there are so many reasons. It's just become a very bad deal for men today and people don't realize it. Well, let's take, let's, let's take marriage for example. Okay. Um, what is it about uh, the way men are treated that would cause them not to want to date, not to want to make that commitment, not, not to get married? People think men are immature, like there's all kinds of books written by Hannah Rawson, like The End of Men, <laughs> and all kinds of things about the decline of men and manning up or whatever. But I think the real thing is that men feel that right now it's just a very poor deal in terms of legal issues. Men don't get kids as often. They're, they're only about 10% of the time do they get child custody. They're the ones paying alimony. We don't even, I just did a radio show and the guys were talking about how they literally were pushed out of the room when their baby was born and told, the mother was told that, was asked questions about, um, you know, is your husband an abuser and that type of thing. And it's just appalling what men go through who are married. We look so much at what women are going through in the workplace, and but we don't turn around and we don't think, well, what are men going through right now, the modern man? What are they going through in terms of domestic relations? Well, how, how did it get to this point? You know, how did it get to the point where a man is shoved out of the birthing room uh, or, or asked these sort of intrusive questions? Is it... As, as Tran James Taranto argues, or it started with feminism gone wrong? Um, to a certain degree. I mean, I used to consider myself a feminist, but I thought feminism meant equality between the sexes, but now it seems to me special privileges for women. So to some degree, yes. I think there were very powerful lobbies. There are there things like NOW or American Organ uh, University of American Women who 
kind of look at these things, and it's a political movement. It's a, it, in politics, it's sort of like, you know, please women, and, you know, the culture mm -hmm. follows that. I think also it's the media. We see all these bumbling dads and idiots on TV, and, you know, men are so upset by the fact that they, they see this every day, and nobody really cares. And so we see men as inept. They can't do the housework. And we hear so many studies, you know, coming out of universities, the academic world, the media world, where men just are unacceptable. They can't do anything right. They can't clean correctly, and we don't look at what men do as important. If a man stays home and he's doing um, yard work or something around the house, that's considered unimportant, whereas women's work is always considered to be more important. You have a nice phrase in the book where you talk about how we've lost, as you say, quote, the wonder of men. Mm -hmm. um, men as construction workers doing mm -hmm. the kind of physical labor that women simply physically can't do. Um, how do we regain, as you called it, that, that wonder of, of how they're different from us? Um, well, I think we just need to appreciate them and stop saying like, oh, the construction workers are leering at women or whatever. We focus so much on what, what we think men are doing to women, but in reality, there's so many men around us who are doctors, who are construction workers, who are doing things to help men, to help women. And I think that what we do is we, we give some aspect of respect. I think that's what's been lost from the d domestic relations is that feeling of respect that men used to have. And I'm not saying in a way like placating men or anything, but as a human being, treating men with respect and realizing that they're important too. What prompted you to write this book? Um, many things. I have a blog and I, wrote, I started writing it in 2005, but uh, 20 years ago when I started my private practice, I had a man in a wheelchair who was being beaten by his wife and there, were, there was no help available for him. And it really got me thinking about what do men do in that situation? And just the men on my blog and the readers from all over the country just prompted me and helping me to understand what men are going through in this country. And the uh, one, last thing I want to say is men are not allowed to speak up. So I'm here as their sort of advocate because if men speak up, they're called whiners, they're called, you wimps. know, wimps, man up, and they're not allowed to talk. Okay, well, it's, it's an important book. Helen Smith, the author of Men on Strike, thank you so much for being thank on you. the show. This is Ed Driscoll for PJMedia.com, and we're talking today with Dr. Helen Smith. If you're a longtime reader of her blog at PJMedia.com, she needs no introduction. But for those stumbling into this podcast from elsewhere, Helen is a psychologist specializing in forensic and men's issues. She holds a Ph.D. from the University of Tennessee and master's degrees from the New School for Social Research and the City University of New York. And she's the wife of Glenn Reynolds of Instapundit.com. She's also the author of the brand new book, Men on Strike, Why Men Are Boycotting Marriage, Fatherhood, and the American Dream, and Why It Matters. It's published by Encounter Books and available from Amazon.com and your local bookstore. And Helen, thanks for stopping by today. Well, thanks so much for having me on your show, Ed. Helen, Ayn Rand originally titled Atlas Shrugged, The Strike. Concurrent with Barack Obama taking office, the words going galt became a more or less household phrase, especially for entrepreneurs and those who are self-employed. So are men in particular going on strike? And if so, in a nutshell, what's causing it? Well, you know, my book is basically about men going on strike and, and sort of reading Ayn Rand sort of got me thinking about it. I had talked about the term on my blog uh, about four or five years ago, and I sort of talked about going galt during during the Obama administration, and that's sort of just withdrawing your production from the world and um, not producing in the sense that because you feel like you are not getting a reward for what you're doing and that there are punishments. And I think in that same vein, we have men today, uh, and I think in, even more so than women, who are sort of going on strike. Um, and what's happening is the basic message um, of my book is that men are acting rationally. The rewards for men in the fields of things like marriage, education, careers, and fatherhood are a lot less than they used to be, and the costs and the dangers are higher. So they're opting out. I mean, kind of like people, you know, opt out when the taxes get so high, they sort of, some people just quit producing as much. And I think in the same vein, as you noted, I think men are not, it's not that they're not producing as much. I think that they're thinking about production more um uh, along the lines, not just to, you know, it used to, I think men were more um, ready to give themselves over to families and um, do, wanted to do things for women, like provide for them and that sort of thing. But now that times have changed, 
Um, unfortunately, I think the traditional, uh, the feelings on the part of women and society are such that women are supposed to, uh, men are supposed to still do those things that are traditional, but at the same time, women have special privileges in the law and um, in marriage and in, uh, in a lot of ways, and I don't think we've changed um, the incentives for men. Helen, there's an astonishing quote early on in your book by Carnell Smith, advocate for male paternity fraud victims, who says, quote, Enslavement used to be based on race. Now it's based on gender, close quote. Helen, could you talk a bit about the history of how we got to this point? If you watch TV's Mad Men, for example, you get the impression that prior to, I guess, about 1968 or so, men were brutish beasts who treated women like dirt on the job, cheated like sailors on their wives, and then feminism arrived in the 1970s and men and women became equals. That's not exactly what happened, though, is it? That's not really exactly what happened. In the old days, we had in the 19th century something called coverture, and it meant that the the women's rights were sort of subsumed by that of a man in a marriage. But in today's world, according to, um, I interviewed different people, experts in the field, and one of them was um, Michael Higdon, who's a law professor at the University of Tennessee, and he explained to me that coverture now is held in the hands of women. Um, Coverture means that those rights are sort of subsumed by the woman, and um, men's rights only go as far as women... (laughs) As, as women allow them to go. For example, um, there are just many aspects if, if, when it comes to things like children. If a man gets divorced, only 10% of the time does he get the custody of the kids. Who pays most of the alimony in the United States? About 97% of it is paid by men. And there are even fights now over permanent alimony and that type of thing where a woman can literally, if she's married a particular length of time, can get permanent, or or not even that long, can get permanent alimony from a man. And I think that what's happened is we've gone from a man-centric society, maybe like you were talking about the mad men, although my sense is it's probably somewhat of an exaggeration. What I want to point out is during coverture that men were were somewhat held responsible. Indeed, I don't, you know, I, of course, there were atrocities committed towards women and there were legal um, damages and things like that, but now we're turning them around, and when they happen to men in our society, people think that's okay. And during um, coverture, if women um, did something uh, that society, like did something illegal, a man was held responsible, and he might have to go to jail. But now it's turned around to where if men do anything, for example, if a woman says he committed domestic violence, he can go to jail, um, often without any due process rights or anything. Um, men are put in jail for owing child support. In fact, fathers and families who, I think it's changed their name now to the National Shared Parent Organization, um, they did a study in, they, in Massachusetts and they found that 90, something like 96% of those people going to jail for child support arre- uh, arrears were men. And they found that men were eight times more likely to be put in jail if they owed child support than women. And so something about that is wrong when the majority of people are going, you know, are male. And going back to the quote that you talked about in the beginning um, it, it, by Carnell Smith, um, I think it's just popular in our culture. It's accepted in our culture that we can be biased against men because they're the last group, pretty much. It's okay to be biased against without a whole lot of repercussions. There's a statistic in your book that I didn't know. You write the quote, in 2010, the latest suicide statistics show that 38,364 people killed themselves nationally, and 30,277 of those were men, unquote. One suicide is a man you mentioned in your book named Thomas Bell, whom you describe as, quote, a man who set himself on fire on the courthouse steps because he felt jerked around by family court, was barely worth mentioning on the evening news for his dramatic ending. Ball, a 58-year-old New Hampshire man, stated that he was, quote, done being bullied for being a man by the family court system, unquote. Which I guess leads to a two-part question. Do people believe that the suicide rate is that skewed towards men? And do they give any thought as to the reason why? Um, good question. Um, no, I think when you hear about suicide, people think about who attempts suicide. And those people who attempt suicide, are, um, women tend to do that more often. Um, and usually either women will get help or they don't tend to use a lethal means. But men tend to, I think women do it more as a cry for help, whereas men do it sort of in hopelessness. 
at least that's my, you know, my, from my 20 year experience working with men who are suicidal. And I think it's just sort of a final thing for them. But our society, when you actually look at um, the media, they always, um, even on a suicide site, they'll often have a picture of a woman or they'll talk about getting women help. But we really don't think about men. We don't, our society is not empathetic to men in the same sense that they're empathetic to women. We don't help them get the mental health um, care that they might need. And in addition, men won't go for mental health care. And as a practitioner, I truly believe this is because in part, I mean, in part, of course, it's conditioning men, of course, to some degree are conditioned to believe that they don't need any help. They are more fearful to ask for help. But it's with good reason. It's because a lot of times if men do complain, they're seen as being a whiner. And there just isn't the societal out pouring of empathy that we have for a woman uh, who has emotional problems. So when men are depressed, they're left on their own to solve the problem. Um, I think men are also reluctant to go to a mental health practitioner, the majority of whom are women. And I've heard from so many men, I mean, this is a bit anecdotal, but I've heard from so many men that they'll go to a, you know, a, a therapist and they will tend to be um, more oriented towards women, or they won't really understand the male point of view as well. And I think that tends to, to make men feel that there isn't any help available or that they would be reluctant to go. And so, yes, I think our society, and, and I don't think our society sees this as important. If men kill themselves, it's just, oh, another man gone, and we see men. There's this feeling in our society that men are expendable. And I think that's unfortunate, and I, I think that perception needs to change. Well, what role does academia play in creating these anti-male perceptions? Glenn wrote the higher education bubble last year, which explored a myriad of problems with America's university system, not the least of which are its costs, in which students rack up tens of thousands of dollars in student loans to get often useless degrees. But how are some of the ways that college is particularly stacked against men? Well, I think that, first of all, it is, goes back even before college where men in the in or boys actually in high schools or before are I think that it's not an experience that a lot of boys can feel connected to there are I think the schools have a lot of um, female oriented activities the readings that they do in schools tend to be uh, more oriented towards girls. For example, they might have some politically correct information from Toni Morrison or other books that boys don't really want to read. There's even been studies, for example, there was a study done by the London School of Economics that found that boys receive lower marks by female teachers and that also a lot of times boys are, their behavior is evaluated and they get a mark based on behavior as opposed to merit. Um, the competitiveness in schools, the sort of politically correct atmosphere is worse for boys than it is for girls. And I don't think it's good for girls either, believe me. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But I think for boys who tend to be um, maybe more individualistic or less likely to conform, less likely to want to sit still, I think that schools are a difficult place to, for them to connect with. And therefore, when they go into the college setting, uh, well, they're less likely to go. That's the, the biggest thing. And right now we're seeing um, it, it get down to where I believe it's heading towards 60% uh, of colleges now are girls. It's, it's basically 57%, and they're saying that it'll rise to 60%. And, you know, where does that stop? I mean, are we going to get to where no boy wants to go to college? And then, as you pointed out, I mean, colleges in the academic world have gotten much more hostile to men. If you go in a class and they're talking about you as some type of pervert, racist, um, you know, um, pedophile, whatever, I mean, a, a man is not going to feel good in a setting like that. And the other thing is our speech codes are so draconian now, and the sexual sort of assault and sexual harassment codes are so difficult for boys that they often, are, it's very a difficult environment to deal with. Um, one of the things that's really concerning is the Obama letter that was sent out in 2011. It was a dear colleague letter that told schools colleges that take federal funds told them that they needed to lower the preponderance of evidence from basically a higher level to a lower one where if, if a guy is charged with sexual assault, they only need 50% evidence or a little over 50% to charge him, you know, with, with having done that, committed that assault. And that's a very serious charge. I mean, 
to charge somebody with a sexual assault can harm a young man's career. Um, they can maybe not finish college. They can be thrown out of school. And we just don't take those things as seriously as we do for women. We, we just wouldn't allow that to happen in, this, in today's world uh, to women. The last decade has seen the entry of the unfortunate phrase, the man cave, enter the vocabulary. What does the rise of the man cave say about the decline of men? Well, I mean, in the old days, um, Brett McKay actually did a beautiful um, post. Uh, he, he wrote The Art of Manliness along with his wife. I believe her name is Kay, but um, they do The Art of Manliness books. But he wrote a wonderful piece on the decline of male space. And one of the things he talks about is how in the old days, men had more, you know, you saw, you saw dad with his slippers and a pipe, and he was right upstairs maybe in the living room of the den. Um, now it seems like men are relegated to the worst part of the house, maybe that the garage or the, the basement. And I think what it says is that even though a lot of men, I think, enjoy dark spaces or like being downstairs, um, a lot of times I think it's just a portion of the house that's allotted to the man that's just... You know, because the whole house is sort of run by the women and the children now, and dad is just an afterthought if he's available in the house at all. I mean, a large majority of boys and, and girls are growing up without dads at all. But if they have one, a lot of times dad's in, you know, in the basement, or it's all about how a woman allows him to have this space in the house. And it's like the house now is the woman's, and a guy is just allowed to live there. And I think that the decline of space, male space in our society um, in the 80s, there was just a lot of, of regulations about, you know, male-only clubs. Um, we even see, you know, so many things are heavily regulated. We don't even see the Elks Club or all those kinds of places. You know, men are discouraged from congregating together. And when they do, they're either made fun of or they're shut down. Um, even in schools, the um, one of the things that was interesting is I – went around to try to find men's centers. And the truth is there are only, I think, two in the United States of, of colleges that even have a men's center. And everyone says, well, the whole campus is a men's center. But actually, that's not the truth. And a lot of guys, when I talked to uh, men who actually had formed a, a men's law group in one of the big public colleges, and they're, one of the uh, heads of this law group told me that you know, they really didn't feel welcome in the environment. They felt like they couldn't really open their mouth, that if they wanted to talk, they really needed to go off campus to do so. And this really sounds to me like how women might have felt maybe in the 1950s or something. Helen, your blog is one of the most popular at PJ Media, and there are a number of comments from your readers quoted in Men on Strike. Could you talk a bit about how the blog posts you wrote and the response to them by your commenters led to the new book and the process in writing it? Um, yes, I actually, um, I stupidly about five years ago, I think I had, or maybe it was six years ago, I did a blog post asking men, um, you know, just asking men, should they get married? And I was sitting, you know, there thinking like, oh, well, it's, you know, there's some nice reasons men should get married. But all the men on my blog really sent me straight. And they really got me thinking and let me know that, you know, something, it is not such a good deal for us. It's really, um, as, as time goes on, so many men are afraid of the legal aspects, the psychological aspects where a lot of the men on my blog mentioned that they, you know, were cut off from friendships, uh, they were cut off from um, spending time with family, friends, and some of the research bears this out. And um, I, I know, well, I don't know if you call this research, but I know there was an article I was reading that was Men's Health, and they talked about how it was so important for men to be around their friends and that actually it's worse for men, uh, for men's self-esteem to have no, you know, not to be around friends when they're married because men tend to be more loners and they don't connect as well. And to lose that during a marriage is to isolate them more. And maybe you see more of a rise in depression in men, which of course, turning that around can lead to the suicide that we were talking about earlier. That's an extreme form. But going back to the blog post, yeah, everything I really learned, I learned a lot from the internet, but it was also from my experience having worked 20 years before with so many men. And I've evaluated, you know, probably five or 6,000 individuals, at least half, probably more of them being men and boys. And just hearing from them and hearing, um, I think the great thing about the blogosphere is that you can hear from so many different voices from really all over the world. But, you know, a lot of what I, the guys I talked to were in the United States. And a lot of them actually write me from PJ Media. I mean, they they write me all the time. And one of the things that really warms my heart about the book so far of the men who have read it, it'll it'll be readers from PJ Media, and it'll be guys who say, you know what, I got your book, 
and my mom or somebody didn't really understand where I was coming from, why I feel, you know, I was always told I was cynical and depressed. I felt alone. And maybe they could, you know, give the book to their mom or maybe it would help maybe even a woman in their life to understand a little bit more. Or at least it, the best thing is that it would maybe make them feel like they're not alone. Like, oh, their ideas are correct and they're feeling that, that things are not right, that the legal and the psychological um, and cultural environment is there is this backlash against men. And I think we need to write that. We need, in the same way we write it against women, we don't want to go so far the other way that we harm our, you know, our men and boys who are so important to the production and to the well-being of this country. Helen, when you discuss the topics explored in Men on Strike with people who haven't read your book or your blog, do they react negatively or surprised at the notion that men can be victims? You know, I don't know if I really want to call it victims. I mean, I guess in some sense that's what people say, but rather than victims, I guess, you know, can mean to be discriminated against. Um, absolutely. But do what do people say? I mean, it depends who you're talking to. A lot of times, for example, um, I was talking maybe to a liberal journalist, and they'll look surprised, and their mind is very close to that type of thing, especially older men, because they feel like they've never seen that in their lifetime. If I talk to younger guys, they totally get what I'm talking about. Um, if I talk to women, they sometimes don't understand. Like what I'll do with women if they talk to me a little bit, and I'll say, they'll tell me, they think my book, they'll hear, if they ask what it's about, I'll, and I say men on strike or why men, I just tell them it's why men don't want to get married. And they think, oh, I'm a, you know, it's a, a psychologist writing a cute book about how to help me learn how to rope a man or something. <laughs> and in truth, it's, it's, that's the antithesis of what the book's about. The book is all about why, you know, from a political and legal standpoint, men don't want to get married anymore. But what I ask women and even men sometimes, is I'll say to them, name me, you know, five reasons five legal reasons men should get married. Now, I understand the psychological ones. You know, they want, to, they want to be with a certain woman. They love this person, of course. But I say, name me five legal reasons. And honestly, I've not had one yet that could. So, you know, I think that, um, I think that sort of opens their eyes sometimes. to. And I, I think that the reaction from women is, I don't think women have ever put themselves in men's shoes. Women talk about being the empathetic sex, but in reality, I'm so bothered in some sense that women don't have um, empathy a lot of times for men. But at the same time, there are a lot of, of great women out there who, if you just sort of, um, if they stop and think about it, they think, oh, well, maybe that sort of makes sense. But the other thing I want to turn around and say is, uh, is from a men's perspective, a lot of men just deny that this is happening. Oh, I've never had that happen, or this is ridiculous, or they want to sort of say, well, I don't believe in this. And I'm it's kind of like there's an old saying that, you know, you may not believe in war, but war believes in you. You may, you know, you may think that nothing will happen to you, but if that uh, woman at your job points a finger at you and says you did something to her, you said something to her inappropriate, and, you know, you don't have a leg to stand on, you may be hauled before the HR department with, with little support, and you may find out that your rights aren't, you know, that being a man isn't going to help you in any way, and that, in fact, you may be a target. We talked about how your blog led to Men on Strike a moment ago. One of the recurring themes that Glenn Reynolds has been writing about since the early days of Instapundent, and that you also discuss in Men on Strike, is that men are invariably the butt of jokes in television advertising. How does this impact how men are viewed by society, and is there anything they can do to fight back against this? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is um, Jim McNamara, he's a public relations uh professor in Sydney, Australia, and he wrote a book called um, Media and Male Identity, which is just terrific. I mean, I can't um, say enough good things about it. It's really a little book of research. But what he found is that 69% of um, the times when men are portrayed in the media are negative. And I really think that affects boys and men in our society. And yes, everybody laughs and says, the butt of, you know, men are the butt of jokes, and they're always being beaten and hit. And Women are slapping men in the face, and men can't throw a ball, you know, the Volkswagen commercial. I think I did a post at PJ Media about that. I mean, there's just a lot of times where men are seen as sort of buffoons and deadbeats. Um, and I think that it is very negative. It's negative for boys to see this type of thing, and it's negative for men to every time they turn on the television. or And, you know, and I think that's also the worst part is it makes it acceptable it's almost like when people see that, they think that that's okay in the same way that maybe a kid sees something on TV and thinks, oh, it's acceptable to talk badly to my parents because that's what they do in my favorite cartoon. 
it's um, it's just a, a negative uh, message, and it, it sends a message to our society that it's acceptable acceptable to bash men and to be hateful towards them. Um, and what can men do about it? Well, first of all, one of the things I point out in the book, and I offer a number of tips and solutions in the final chapter. Um, one of the things that I, you know, is don't laugh yourself. I mean, sure, it's funny if it's like, you know, a comedy or whatever, and I understand, um, you know, some of that stuff is funny. But when you see a man being punched in the face by a woman or another man, it's it's really not funny. So I, first of all, I'd try to control your own behavior, but also I'd call, I'd tell men to call other men and women out when they're laughing at such things. Or if you see an ad, um, Glenn Sachs, who um, runs a, a website, glennsachs.com, who's a men's rights activist, um, he does a beautiful job where he'll campaign. When he sees something negative in the media, he'll get all like the guys on his site, and they'll all campaign against it if they see something negative against men. And they've often got th- times gotten things taken down or have been very successful. So don't be afraid to you know write in, write emails. And I know a lot of PJ media uh, you know readers are very you know activist, and they will do some of those things. So I think to to keep that up and to um, just be aware and not to put up with it when you're out in society and people are laughing because I think when we, we when we tell or let other people think that that's acceptable behavior, then it, it becomes ingrained, and I just think that's a negative place to be. Well, last question. Going forward, as more and more men see the system in general as stacked up against them, should they fight back? Should they bail out on society and go galt or both? Um, well, in the book, I do talk about a combination of both, and I think you have to look at it as a psychologist. I look at people's sort of psychology of who are they and how do they feel. Do you feel like you're, are you a person who likes to stand up and say, you know, I'm not going to take this anymore? I think you have to use the strengths or the weaknesses that you have and to sort of extrapolate from there. If you feel it's something that you just don't want to handle and, and you you feel like um, going galt or just opting out. I mean, a lot of men, I see a lot of guys around, I'm from Tennessee, and you know, a lot of guys are just riding around in their truck, drinking a beer, enjoying, uh, they're self-employed. Maybe they have, you know, some type of small business and maybe they're not married and they just enjoy um, doing doing their own thing. Um, or, or maybe they still date women, but they maybe they don't want to be married. Um, and of course, I'm not, I, I think marriage is a great thing. I've actually, my um 19th anniversary is coming up on the day my book comes out, and which is really exciting. So I, I certainly advocate marriage, but I don't advocate it in the, you know, I don't advocate the legal terms out there for men at this point. But um, I do think just as a man to be aware of what's going on um, and, and, and do fight back. And I, I do think going in and people say, like, don't get involved, like internet chat rooms and things like that. But I don't think it's a bad thing when you see people, say, even at the Wall Street Journal or people over at the New York Times, go over there and put your two cents in. And I see people even over the, at the Atlantic, a lot of men get on that site, um, and they will really go after, you know, somebody who's got something negative to say about men. And I think that's terrific because it lets people know there's another option out there besides making fun of men and treating them as the enemy. I mean, we're all friends here. We all want to get along, and we all want to make the best of our society, hopefully, if we're decent human beings. And in that vein, I think it's important that um, we learn that men and boys do have feelings and that we do need to protect, um, you know, constitutionally and psychologically those men and boys in our society, just like we do women and girls. This has been Ed Driscoll for PJ Media, and we've been talking with Helen Smith, who blogs at pjmedia.com forward slash Dr. Helen, and is the author of Men on Strike, Why Men Are Boycotting Marriage, Fatherhood, and the American Dream, and Why It Matters. It's published by Encounter Books and available from Amazon.com in your local bookstore. And Helen, continued success with both the book and the blog, and thank you once again for stopping by today. Thanks so much, Ed. I really appreciate it.